so thanks so much. Uh, I am somewhat unaccustomed to speaking in front of such large crowds. We Canadian novelists don't uh, get this kind of an audience generally. I well remember a talk I gave at the Ottawa Public Library just across the river, the main branch, and they have this cavernous lecture theater. And I was brought in to talk about my, my first novel, and they ushered me into the green room first to get me ready. And then we walked out into the hall, I was introduced, I made it to the podium, and I looked up to see in a lecture hall that would hold three or four hundred people, there were six people in the audience. Then I had the misfortune of looking a little more closely and realized that four of them worked at the library. So, <laughs> so CPRS, you have uh, outdone yourselves. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I am a, a member in good standing of the uh, Write What You Know School of Writing. Those of you who may have read either of my first two novels can find pieces of me and pieces of my life strewn about the pages. Not so much in an autobiographical sense, I just find it easier to write with authority and conviction and authenticity if I'm writing about something that I know about or care about or have experienced. So there's some politics in those first two novels. Bruce mentioned that I worked on Parliament Hill and at Queen's Park. Certainly have some views on politics, but had I written a rage-filled, non-fiction polemic about my thoughts on politics, it never would have been published, nobody would have read it, and Bruce would have been introducing somebody else here this afternoon. Uh, so I thought I would cloak my ideas in a, in a funny story and, and put the, give voice to my thoughts to some characters that you might come to enjoy. Uh, there's some engineering in those first two novels. I am an engineer. I have not practiced a day of engineering in my life. Uh, but I have no regrets about doing the degree. In fact, I think I was an engineer before I even studied engineering at McMaster. I think like an engineer. I uh, plan my novels the way an engineer might design a bridge. Uh, so it's never that far from me. Uh, there's some grammar, a couple of grammar aficionados in those first two novels. My father engendered in his offspring a love of the English language. And I remember sitting around the dinner table on Sunday nights and we would debate the geopolitical implications of the split infinitive and, <clears throat> and other pressing matters. It did help to cut down on dinner guests, which was nice. Uh, you know, there's an older woman with Parkinson's disease in those first two novels. My grandmother had Parkinson's. There's some chess in those novels. I like to play chess. I'm not very good, but I've played it long enough to appreciate the glory of the game and what a wonderful metaphor it is for life, for politics, for business, uh, for warfare, for many things. And there's also a hovercraft in those first two novels. And I just thought all political satires had hovercrafts in them. I was ju <laughs> just trying to follow the convention there. Actually, a friend and I, when we were 15, designed and built a full-sized hovercraft. And, so I know far more than any sane person ought to know about hovercrafts, and if you've read either of those first two novels, now you know more than any sane person uh, ought to know about them. Uh, so I, I do write what I know. It's just easier, because I don't really enjoy doing hardcore literary research very much. I like to write from my own experience. So when I told people I was writing a third novel, they wondered what parts of me might they find in the pages of Up and Down. And what I've done there is combined an almost lifelong fascination with the space program with 25 years in the PR agency world. Uh, and I can certainly write about that without having to do uh, any research. I didn't really know it at the time I was writing these novels, but it's not really a very long trip from public relations to writing novels. In the world of PR, we're trying to communicate with a particular audience, we're trying to connect with them on some level, have them understand something, have them believe something, have them take some kind of action, buy a product, vote a certain way, complain about something, speak up. We want to persuade them. We want them to consider whatever it is that we have written or that we're promoting or that we're advancing. We want it to be seen by them as credible, as believable, as reasonable, as truthful. Uh, and if you are going to meet your own professional and personal standards, I hope the truthful part will always be there. Now, if you think about what I've been doing as a novelist, when I'm writing a novel, I'm trying to connect with a particular audience. I want them to find the voice that I'm using and the message that I'm conveying and the story I'm telling to be credible, believable, reasonable, truthful. 
fiction is a very effective vehicle for truth-telling. So as, as a novelist, I find myself worrying about the same things when I'm at home in our library writing that I worry about sitting at my office in, in Toronto at, uh, at Thornley Fallis. Will I be able to make my audience understand and believe what I'm saying? Will they connect with my story? Uh, I write speeches as part of my day job. I'm sure many of you in the room also do that. <clears throat> to me, nothing seems closer to writing novels than writing speeches. You put yourself in someone else's shoes, you find their voice, you write words in that new voice, and it's not your own, at least it ought not to be your own. And the last time I checked, that's what I do when I'm writing novels and I'm writing dialogue for the characters that I have created. The characters don't pay as well as the clients I usually write speeches for, but uh, it's all part of the same thing. So it, it's not a big leap from PR to novels. I think successful novelists and successful PR professionals tend to share an ability to create and communicate stories that move people. Sometimes in a PR program, you're moving them to action. In a novel, you might be moving them to tears or to laughter or to outrage. That's the power of storytelling. On page one of the novel, Up and Down, uh, the narrator, a guy named David Stewart, joins the Toronto office of a multinational PR agency, something I did in January of 1988, not long before Bruce McClellan joined our ranks and took us to a whole new level. Uh, so, uh, you became Hill and Knowlton eventually. When I joined, it was Public Affairs International. So the portrayal of agency life in the novel, I hope, uh, is informed by more than a quarter century's worth of agency experience, right back to writing what I know. Uh, much has changed in that time. Uh, much has stayed the same. Maybe just to set up the novel a little bit, David, when he joins the firm, is thrown into the deep end right away uh, he is asked to work on a new business pitch with their Washington office, and the client is NASA. NASA believes they ought to hire a PR agency because for the preceding two decades or so, they have been watching their institutional life flashing before their eyes. Congress has had them on a steadily declining budget uh, for the previous 20 years. Back in the halcyon days of the Apollo missions, fully 5% of the U.S. federal budget went to NASA. Last year, less than half of 1% went to NASA. So they want to hire a PR agency to rekindle public interest in the space program. And they end up going with an idea that comes from the brain of David Stewart, the narrator. They decide to organize a citizen astronaut lottery where one average American citizen, one average Canadian citizen, drawn at random from the millions of entries, will get a chance to train for a shuttle mission and spend a week on the space station. Uh, so that's the storyline. Now, I thought I would pull out a few lines from the novel to help us look at life in an agency, life in the PR profession, and perhaps help us divine what is true, what is not, what has changed, and what has remained the same. So it doesn't really start that well. Uh, the first words in the novel I will read to you. Welcome to the dark side. Diane Martineau smiled as she said it, but still, those were her words. It was my first day in the Toronto office of the international PR agency, Turner King, and I was already tired of hearing my new profession linked with Lucifer, Lord of the Underworld. <laughs> so, that line is uttered by the general manager. Uh, she's joking, of course, she's using irony, I suppose, but regrettably, I think it's still true that huge swaths of the population across North America and probably the world continue to believe that what we do as a profession has little connection to do, has little connection to, to truth-telling, that it's some kind of you know, unseemly, it's somewhat underhanded, manipulative, ethically stunted perhaps. We've all heard the misperceptions of what we do. We know that view is misguided, we know that it's wrong, but we're so busy in our own daily lives as PR professionals working with the organizations within which we work or the clients we serve that it's hard to find time to burnish the image of our profession itself. And I think that ought to remain a priority for uh, our, our industry. And certainly the good work of uh, the foundation and CPRS and the other organizations in this world uh, related to our business, they will help. But 
We still have that classic, the fruit farmer's children have scurvy syndrome. We're just not that great at doing it for ourselves, and we probably need to. Let me uh, skip ahead in the book. I'm going to leap ahead all the way to page two. Uh, this is still at David Stewart's first day on the job. This is a bit about uh, agency life. And this is the general manager talking to him. She says, don't worry about life in a PR agency. We'll show you the ropes and try not to let you hang yourself in the first few weeks. And David says, so is there anything I should know before you know, hitting the ground running? Oh, there's tons of stuff you should know, but like most big, unwieldy, hidebound global PR agencies, we have no real, well-established and effective orientation program to bring you into this foreign land in a logical and orderly fashion. So you'll get the same treatment everyone else gets. I'll introduce you around, and then we'll throw you in the deep end and occasionally toss you an anchor to see if you can adapt and evolve. We'll know pretty soon if you're going to survive, you'll know slightly sooner if you're as smart as we think you are. <laughs> now, I can't say with certainty that that remains true in all big PR agencies, but I think it's safe to say that in general, most PR firms, small, medium, and large, probably could do a better job at introducing and orienting new recruits to the firm. I certainly know that's true in our shop. Our focus tends to be more on our clients and on other higher priorities. Perhaps billable hours might be uh, among them. Uh, let me carry on with another little snippet. I think I'm going all the way up to page three now. This, uh, this one covers uh, a lot of ground. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to track down where I... Ah, here we are. <clears throat> just before our walk around, let me offer you a few words of advice. In the early going, listen more than you talk. Your nice guy personality and chemistry you should be able to establish with colleagues, clients, and new business prospects will take you further than almost anything else. It's one of the reasons I hired you. But we also need you to think, write, and speak with clarity and conviction. If necessary, you can fake the conviction part till it comes, but the clarity needs to be there right out of the gate. Clients deserve your best advice, particularly when they learn that your billing rate is $125 an hour, $225 an hour. Thankfully, the age of spin is over, or at least on the wane, so always tell the truth and do the right thing, but with care and sensitivity. The idea is to keep the clients for as long as we can. You probably already know this, but at Turner King, the center of the universe is New York. When our arrogant U.S. colleagues deign to acknowledge our backwater existence up here, they invariably believe they're far ahead of us, a dubious conclusion when most of them have their heads stuck well up their own arses. So beware. Finally, we exist to make money. We must make money. So always, always use prots to track your time daily on client projects. I made it almost to the end. Prots? Oops, sorry about that. It's a big P, isn't it? Prots? It sounded to me like the intestinal strife tourists suffer after a two-star Mexican getaway. It stands for Public Relations on Online Time Tracking System. Use it or there'll be no invoice to send at the end of the month and your tenure with Turner King will be very, very short. So that section covers a, a lot of ground, but it certainly covers most of what I always look for when we're hiring new PR pros who I think are going to become leaders in the firm and hopefully leaders in the field. First of all, good writing. That's the floor. That's the price of entry to our world. You cannot fake good writing. I don't think it often can actually be taught. It's something that I think is there or it's not. I've sort of come to believe that you can make a good writer a better writer but I'm less convinced that without a solid, strong base of writing skills that you can get much better than you already are. So it's an uphill battle if the writing isn't there right out of the gate. Clear thinking. The trendy way to describe that in this day and age, I think, is can they think strategically? To me, clarity of thought or thinking strategically is really just another term for common sense. Can you look at a complex situation and really understand what's going on? What can we influence? What do we not have any influence over? What might be masquerading as a cause, but is really just a symptom? 
that clarity of thought is so important and you will agree with me, I think, that it's difficult to find. Being able to speak, being well-spoken, it seems simple enough, but certainly in the agency world, being a good writer and a clear thinker just ain't enough. You need to be able to stand up in a boardroom of strangers and be compelling, be persuasive, speak with authority, conviction, and confidence, even if that confidence that shows on the outside may not really be how you're truly feeling on the inside, and we've all been there in presentations. So you need to be good on your feet. The next one is kind of hard to get your arms around. It's an attribute, it's a skill or a character trait. For some people, I think it's even a gift that's often overlooked, yet I think it's probably as important as anything else on the list. And that is, can you connect well with people? Are you good at chemistry, the fit, the elusive personality question? Can you read the room? Can you read the people in the room? I don't think it's so much of a case of can you be nice, it's more about are you actually nice? Because I think the difference is it helps if your personality that you're showing to clients and to colleagues actually is the real you. I think we've all worked with people over the years who are brilliant writers, thoughtful strategists, good presenters, but with whom you would not want to be spending a lot of time. You can be all of those things and still be a jerk or a jackass. I'm not sure I can tell you the difference between a jerk and a jackass, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> For all of their other gifts, these people usually don't make it to the top of our profession. They stall mid-career, and if you think about your past jobs as you were building your own career, you can probably identify these people who just drifted away. Uh, I think that ability to connect with people in a very genuine way, to make them enjoy the experience of working with you as a client or as a consultant or as a colleague, that remains, I think, a bedrock skill for the successful public relations professional. Let me add one that wasn't really referred to in the novel, but I kind of wish I had added it. I've come to believe in the last few years that the best PR pros are those who are blessed with more than their fair share of curiosity. We don't often talk about curiosity, but I think if you have it, it can sustain you in this career. And the agency world in particular is a mecca for curious people. Uh, we have to become instant experts on different issues, sectors, and companies. And if you're curious, that appeals to you. If you like to have those balls in the air, that can be very appealing. It's a fascinating place to work on the agency side if you are blessed with curiosity. And if you couple that with creativity, that can be a very potent combination. I mentioned the concept of billable hours in that reading. It's touched upon in that section. Uh, one could hardly write about, about a multinational PR agency and not deal with the question of billable hours, or for that matter, with the importance of the agency making money and operating as a sound and viable business. That, I think, uh, will never change. I also mentioned the primacy of New York. Uh, for those of us in this room who have worked for multinational agencies, that might have struck a familiar chord with you, as I suspect does the reality that we in Canada know so much more about the United States than our American colleagues know about our country. I had some fun with those stereotypes uh, in this novel. Finally, there was that comment from the general manager in, in the passage that the idea of the age of spin being over, or at least on the wane, I hope this is true. I think it is true. I worry sometimes that my eternally optimistic outlook may be overstating this, but by and large, I think most PR professionals worth their salt subscribe to the notion, tell the truth, and tell it well. Uh, I think many agencies continue to struggle with silos within the organization. Uh, I remember at Hill and Knowlton, there was a bit of, it was always an issue, I think, Bruce, you think back to then. We had our own teams and we were responsible for their billable hours. And sometimes assembling the very best team for a client should have involved pulling someone from someone else's profit center to add to the team. And there were plenty of incentives not to do that because of how the silos were set up. Uh, I think I have another section here that I was going to read there. Oh, I should have all these ready. Here we go. Here we go. So this is still uh, Diane, the general manager, talking as she's walking him around the office. 
It's important to accept that the modern PR agency is a universe unto itself. It is a hydra. When the economy is booming, the multiple heads actually work with one another and sometimes even like one another. But in bad times, it's every head for itself and decapitations are common. So I remember some of those days. Uh, and finally, there's a, a section here about the agency as a marketplace. Uh, if I can find that. Here we are. An agency is like a marketplace. Work flows down to those who do it well, do it on time, and do it without complaint. If you look around almost any large PR agency, the junior staffers who are swamped tend to be the good ones, the keepers. But those who can always be found with time on their hands usually have that extra time for a reason. They've already been tried by the senior consultants or account directors above them and somehow fallen short, missed a deadline, missed a meeting, or missed the point. So repeat business dries up. It's not good news if most others at your level in the organization are crazy busy and you are not. So uh, that's one of the harsh realities of agency life and I think it's probably as true today as it's ever been. Survival of the fittest, or the smartest, or the fastest, survival of the best, I think still prevails in the agency world. So I think something that has changed in those years, the last 25 years, is the concept of the key message. There's a phrase that uh, is probably used more often by the people in this room than almost any phrase ever. In the old days, in the early part of my career, the key message was actually a carefully crafted 23-word sentence that we would demand that our clients memorize and regurgitate word for word in interviews over and over again. We did that to maximize control and to make sure that the message would make it onto the air or into print. I think those days are behind us and have been for a while. I just haven't spoken to a PR audience for a while. Uh, and I think probably for good reason. Journalists and the public have become so jaded about corporate spokespersons and the canned message track. They tune it out. They stop listening to it. They don't believe it. So we should stop using it. This became clear to me during a federal election campaign some years ago when Paul Martin was prime minister. In the middle of the campaign, he did an interview with Peter Mansbridge, a one-on-one. -on -one. And in the middle of the interview, Peter Mansbridge asked the prime minister a question. When the question ended, Paul Martin ignored the question and switched into the message du jour. Uh, whatever was on the campaign trail that day, whatever the announcement was, he went right on to that without even paying passing tribute to the question. Halfway through his response, Peter Mansbridge put his hand up. He didn't interrupt him vocally, but he put his hand up. The Prime Minister looked a bit puzzled and finished his answer, and then Peter Mansbridge said, which is something I had never ever heard before, Prime Minister, I know that's the message of the day, but could you please answer the question I just asked you? And you don't see that to the Prime Minister uh, from a, a journalist. And I think for me, it was at least the tipping point that we had gone beyond the value of the canned message track. It kind of reminded me of Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon's Secretary of State, who once walked into the State Department media briefing room, stood in front of 15 cameras and 50 or 60 reporters, and said, as only Henry Kissinger could say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, do any of you have any questions for my answers? <laughs> it's a great line. I, I use it every time I do a media training session. So when I am doing media training, and Bruce and I were talking about this uh, over lunch, uh, I don't talk about key messages. I sort of talk about, I might call them key message points. What's the idea we want to leave with the audience? What's the sentiment we want them to feel at the end? So then I urge the client to, you know, to tell anecdotes, to tell stories, to resort, resort to storytelling. Give some proof points, bring it to life. Don't repeat yourself, don't go back to the same message. Use a different anecdote to reinforce the same message you're trying to leave with them. So employ storytelling to entrench your message rather than repeating the canned and often unsubstantiated platitude that we've relied on at least uh, for too long, I think. But there's another big change that we've uh, witnessed in the last uh, 10 years. 
I think one of the most profound changes to hit our profession since the invention of the news release came about, of course, when the internet came upon the scene in the latter part of the last century. I think it ranks right up there with the printing press and the Industrial Revolution and powered flight. But just when we were starting to get a grip on the internet, in the early part of the new millennium, something else hit us that I think was of even more profound consequence, perhaps, though one facilitates the other, and that is social media. At the time, many of us felt the ground shifting beneath our feet as communicators. It certainly came at a good time for me. By then, I had been a PR agency veteran for more than 15 years, and while I wouldn't say I was bored, I was certainly looking for something new to sustain my excitement about my career. Social media delivered that in a very big way for me, as I expect it did for some of you. You see, to me as a consultant, my colleagues and I solve problems for our clients. We tackle challenges that they bring to us. And in those early days of, of PR, long before the internet and social media, we had a toolbox that included things like special events, media relations, news conferences, news releases, collateral materials, backgrounders, you know, the standard fare that we leaned on for so many years. We had our tried and true vehicles for reaching out to our target audiences. Social media has given us a whole new set of platforms and techniques that allow us to reach over top of the media and to go directly to our audiences. Not only can we reach them without as many filters, uh, we can actually create and nurture communities of interest. That was an epiphany for me. That was a revelation. Some agencies were skeptical. Some agencies, I think, still are. Uh, but we immersed ourselves in this new and emerging world, not by reading about it, but by doing it. In the earliest days, we built a company wiki. We had several blogs that we were experimenting with in our firm. My, uh, my co-founder, Joe Thornley, was very much into blogs and blogging, and, and still is, so I decided to focus my atten attention on podcasting. I loved trolling through the iTunes podcast directory in those early days and finding new, great new content that I could listen to on my walk to and from the office every day. I swear to you, I haven't turned on my car radio in six years. But as much as I looked, I could not find a true public relations podcast. So we started one in April 2006, when podcasting was still very much in its infancy. David Jones, some of you may know him, uh, he was with our firm at the time. We created and hosted together and produced a podcast called Inside PR. It was a weekly half-hour show, not about social media, though we used that platform to, to deliver it. It was about public relations and perhaps uh, about agency life in particular. And we did that show for more than 200 weekly half-hour episodes without missing a week. Christmas, all through the summer, every Sunday night at about 10 o'clock, Dave and I would be on Skype with one another, recording our respective ends of the podcast. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, I remember as we planned out the show, thinking that we had to get started. We had to get this podcast on the air. We had to do it because someone in the next three weeks is going to start a PR podcast, and we want to be first. So some uh, seven years later, uh, there really aren't any other PR podcast, or not many. There are some. There's a great one, Young PR Pros is out there, and there are a few, but uh, we need not have worried quite as much as we did about getting out of the gate uh, early. Uh, it did help us get moving, but it was a great experience, taught us a lot about public relations, taught us a lot about social media. It taught us a lot about engaging and sustaining and building a community. Uh, we actually learned that several PR programs at universities and colleges in other countries actually make their students listen to inside PR as a required part of the curriculum. Uh, that was uh, certainly very gratifying and made us a little more nervous each time we would hit the big red button and start uh, recording. Uh, but the show continues today. We gave up on it a couple of years ago, Dave and I did, but Inside PR continues. Joe Thornley here in Ottawa, Martin Waxman in Toronto, and Ginny Dietrich in Chicago now have the helm of Inside PR. It's a little bit more social media oriented now, but it, it still carries on some seven years later. So what social media has done for me and for our firm and for others, I think, is that it means when we have a client bringing us a challenge, we have a much bigger toolbox. It allows us to be more 
almost agnostic about what we provide as a solution and to think more broadly. In some cases it might be a social media fix, in others it might be a more traditional media relations play. The most fulfilling projects I think for me and for my colleagues are those that are fully integrated, that pick from all across the ambit of those uh, tools and disciplines that we ha now have at our disposal. In the last several years, the debate that I think we know well in this room has continued to rage, who owns social media? Ad agencies are leaping in, the marketing shops are there, the digital agencies are all doing it, and thankfully lots of PR agencies are showing leadership in the social media space too. I may be biased, but to my thinking, PR professionals are in the strongest position to counsel clients on social media and to integrate it into their broader communications program. I always thought that PR professionals bring the broadest and most balanced perspective. Without generalizing or stereotyping too much, the ad agencies and the marketing houses, they can often be very focused on sales, on moving product. Well, social media is really a better platform for delivering content, for building communities, and enhancing reputation. It's not as well suited for hardcore sales. So I'm very much a strong proponent of PR professionals adding social media to their arsenal if you haven't already. It's here to stay, and I think we're the most qualified and the best position to deliver our, to deliver our clients the social media counsel that they need. No need to burst into spontaneous applause there, but do we have agreement on that? I actually believe that uh, social media and the practices and the principles that underpin social media have affected how we practice PR and communications by imposing a new set of transparency and forthrightness that the public has now come to expect. Uh, and beyond the digital space, I think that the roots of this shift can be found in social media and I think this move to greater transparency and directness and openness is good for public relations, it's good for agencies and it's good for clients. Uh, my plunge into social media back in the early 2000s did something else for me. Uh, it actually played a very important role in getting me started as a novelist. When I finished my first novel about Canadian politics back in 2005, I honestly didn't know whether I had written anything worthy of anyone's time. Uh, those of you who are also writers in the room will know that your sense of perspective and what you have, have written can completely abandon you after you've labored over a manuscript for a long, long time. So. Uh, I sent out dozens and dozens and dozens of, of query letters, plot synopses, sample chapters to agents and publishers across the country and then I sat back and in my wildest dreams waited for the feeding frenzy to ensue over my debut blockbuster novel. And I waited and waited and waited, followed up diligently, waited some more. The feeding frenzy seemed to be taking some time to get started. And after a year of doing that, do you know how many rejection letters I had received? Not a single one. That's the impact that I had on the traditional publishing world my first time out. I couldn't even get an automated rejection letter from out of a publisher. So I, in late 2006, I, after a year of doing this, I decided that there was no evidence to suggest that were I to continue on that path, anything was going to change. So I decided, to self-publish, the dreaded self-publishing. I was so naive, I just thought, wouldn't it be easier to find a real publisher if I could hand them a book to read rather than a stack of 400 manuscript pages? And I realized, though, that as a good PR person, that I was going to need to build an audience for this novel on my own because I didn't have a publicist at the publishing house to help me out. So to help build an audience for my first novel, long before it was ever a printed book, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I podcast the whole novel chapter by chapter. I could not have done that had we not started Inside PR eight months earlier. I knew how to podcast. I knew how to use the equipment to edit, to produce, to upload, to add the music at the front and the music at the back and all those cool things. Uh, and it isn't that hard, by the way. Uh, so I podcast the novel, started uploading chapters one per week, starting in January 2007, having no idea whether anyone would find it, and if they found it, whether they would find favor with it. I leaned on my podcasting friends, the podcasting community. I sent out 
customized audio promos to all of my favorite podcasts, and they dutifully played them, and I immediately saw an uptick in, subs in subscribers, and it continued to grow. I got lots of wonderful emails from people all over the world who were listening to the novels, and in fact, it was those positive comments that came back to me that gave me the resolve to carry on with the self-publishing process. And in September of 2007, the offices of Thornley Fallis in Toronto, a box arrived one afternoon. It was my author package. It was a cardboard box, and inside were 10 copies of my self-published novel. They were the only 10 copies in existence, uh, because it's all print on demand. So I was thrilled. It looked like a real book. You know, there were page numbers on each page. I was thrilled, and I started living the glamorous high life of the self-published novelist, which meant that I immediately ordered a box of books from the publisher, 48 of them, and I would drive around in between client meetings, and I would pull up in front of uh, independent bookstores, and I would walk in with five copies of my book, and I would go to the proprietor, and I would say, you know, I've written this political satire, I think it's pretty good, would you sell it on consignment in your store? And immediately this wave of pain and angst would wash across their face. And they would look at the book, they would read the back cover, they would look at a couple of pages, they would notice on the front cover a little positive blurb I had from Alan Rock, our former justice minister and UN ambassador. And they would sometimes say, does Alan Rock know about this? <clears throat> Eventually, I, I would persuade him that all was on the up and up, and they, he would say, well, let's take two. So we would put them on the fiction shelves, and sometimes, if I had a minute, I would come back to the same bookstore the next day, after shift change in the bookstore, and I would just go up to the counter and say, yes, I'm looking for that great new political satire, but... Okay, I didn't do that. But, but I would go in, and I would stand in front of the fiction shelves, and I would see my book on the shelf, and there it would be cover facing out, because that's how I put it there the day before. But I would see my heroes above me and below me, Robertson Davies and Mordecai Richler and Paul Quarrington, and these wonderful writers I have revered and read and followed uh, for many years. I was on the same shelf with them, and it was an extraordinary thrill for me. And if there were no one else in the bookstore, I would often surreptitiously unholster my Blackberry and take a photograph of my book on the shelf. And if you go to the archives of my blog back to the fall of 2007, you can find those photographs there. Uh, so it was, I was living my dream. I'd written a novel, uh, and my friends at McMaster will appreciate this. One day, about two weeks after the box came in, I got a phone call from the manager of the bookstore at McMaster University who had stumbled upon my book when they were ordering books. And they said, well, you've written a novel. This is great. Congratulations. Why don't you come down to McMaster? We'll order some books and we'll do a, a book launch for you here in the store. And I thought, wow, that's fantastic. That's what real authors get. So I went down on the appointed day. I wore a suit and tie. I don't think any novelist in the history of literature has worn a suit and tie to their book launch, but what did I know? Uh, so there were posters all over campus. I walked into the bookstore. There was a massive display of books. Well, there were about a dozen books. That is a massive display for a self-published novelist. And it was wonderfully organized. I was introduced. I read a section. I talked about the book. Both people who came bought books. <laughs> but I, I was living my dream. When I got back to the office the next day, flush from my triumphant book signing at McMaster, uh, I looked over on my radiator, and there was the cardboard box filled with the 10 copies of my novel. At that point, they were the only 10 copies I had left. I'd exhausted my supply already. And uh, I said, what am I going to do with these? And in a moment of false bravado or something, I went to the website of the Leacock Medal for Humor, and most literary awards don't allow self-published novels to be considered. They're explicitly excluded from consideration. There was no such restriction on the Leacock Medal, clearly an oversight on their part. <laughs> so I, I packaged it up. They needed 10 copies, and that's what I had. I swear if they'd needed 11, or if I hadn't had a cardboard box, Again, Bruce would, be, would have been introducing somebody else uh, here today. Uh, so uh, 
winning the Leacock Medal and uh, setting me off on this writing path was a, something that changed my life. And it could not have happened were I not part of this public relations fraternity. Uh, I'm going to just read you one final little section. Uh, and then we can open up for questions if we have time. Uh, so this is later on in the book, but at one point uh, the narrator says, our media relations effort also yielded 158 editorials and opinion pieces. Predictably, about a third of them were negative, linked most often to the cost of putting civilians in space. There was also plenty of criticism that the contest was simply a PR exercise with no real purpose beyond hype. As I read this, I realized that we needed to do a PR job on the term PR. Those two little letters attached to my chosen profession were, un were usually delivered with a dismissive head shake, a pejorative tone, and a look that straddled disdain and disgust. In the modern vernacular, it was just a PR exercise, really meant whatever it was, that it was completely devoid of substance, or that smoke mirrors or both were somehow involved, or that someone like me was spinning one lonely little positive attribute into a towering all-powerful juggernaut of virtue while downplaying and even, and even ignoring a boatload of horrific side effects that threatened, please select one or more of the following options, children, animals, trees, water, air, earth, the ozone layer, the Idaho striped blister beetle, and the entire human race. In my mind, that was the old PR, an outdated stereotype in decline. I was a practitioner of the new PR. As far as I was concerned, my job was to tell the truth and tell it well. And no, that's not spin. I believed it. And I hope all of us believe that. Thank you. Thank you.